Thank you very much, uh, Amir. That was a great lecture again. And uh, uh, the, the the session is now open for questions, if anyone have questions. So, so Diego Heberman, Dr. Diego Heberman is from Argentina. Diego, do you want to give the question, please? Uh, yes, hello. Good afternoon to everybody. Hi. Uh, uh, how are you? Uh, attend uh, the presentation and congratulations. I'd like to know if you see some place for MRI functional calculation using the uptake rate of hepatobiliary agents, not only to see, to, to watch the volume, but also functional for patients, not only for the graft, but also for the donor future remand, just to avoid the post-surgery impairment, no? So you, you mean basically using a sort of and looking at the basic functional imaging based on the uptake, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I have not, but as I said, um, uh, most of the cohort that uh, I've seen, uh, they are usually very young and very healthy patients. Uh, we don't do that, obviously. You know, uh, there's great role for it. Uh, but um, it, interestingly, is that uh, the main issue in our cohort was osteotosis because nowadays everybody has it, and then they have they start a program uh, in uh, at UPMC that there are some donors that they had osteotosis, and because of that they would have been excluded. Uh, but they have this uh, very very uh, short uh, weight loss program uh, with a very very low um, calorie restriction, so they will go under that, and then we follow the PDFF. Uh, with MRI, and then when they become eligible, then they will be donors. So, uh, I mean, uh, Abby can talk about the outcomes, uh, but but I can say that besides the osteotosis, um, there are not much concern about fibrosis, and that's why that we we, we are not including MRE in our protocol yet. Uh, I'm not saying we should not, but because of you know our resources, because uh, we have to you know, so many patients, we have to use uh, uh, you know allocate them to. To, to the right um, scanner, so we don't do that. Uh, but, but obviously, there's a lot of room for doing uh, more comprehensive MRI evaluation of these. Uh, for for the future remnant, uh, to be honest, like our only evaluation is just a CT. So all of them routinely get a CT uh, in three months, and it's a non-con CT, basically just. Uh, calculating the liver, make sure that it grew back to 80% of the initial total liver volume. So that's all the um, workup that we do. Obviously, they do a lot of lab work, but imaging-wise, that's the only one we do. So I'm not aware of doing more you know, MRI or more comprehensive imaging on the, um, on the donors. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, the, Dr. Eberman and Dr. Burhani. Any other question from the audience? Claude, do you want to give a question? I'm sure Claude wants oh, hey, to give uh, a question as usual. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Khaled, I think. We, we uh, can't have this uh, session without hearing you, Dr. Serlo. I see, I see, okay, all right, well, uh, Amir, uh, Amir, that was just a terrific lecture. Thank you so much. Really, Thank really uh, appreciate your lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, another comment is that we have been, within LIRADS, we've been thinking about putting together uh, some material uh, on evaluation of uh, liver donors uh, and putting together some structured um, you know, some templated standardized reports, et cetera, et cetera. So Victoria and I will be uh, for sure reaching out to you to see if you'd be uh, interested in uh, Absolutely. contributing to that. And of course, we'd want to do this in a way that is um, uh, in harmony with whatever else is going on and and not in any way to be inconsistent or uh, with, you know, with any other um, uh, projects along these lines. But so we'll be reaching out to you. Now, I do have a, uh, one question I have for you is, um, what degree of liver fat, of PDFF, uh, will cause, and, and if you've mentioned this, I apologize, will cause you to uh, tell a donor, a potential donor, that they can't be a donor, or, or that will cause you to put them on some weight loss program? Yeah, so um, uh, again, uh, Abby, whom are tomorrow, like you know, uh, who be also like you know, a better person to talk. But uh, so uh, my understanding is that in our program is very, very case based. So there's no like absolute contraindication unless like the patient has the donor has cirrhosis or malignancy. But besides that, it really depends on what's the indication 
uh, for the recipient, and then how many donors they have. So it's based on that. Uh, the patients that went under um, uh, like ultra short weight loss program, there were people that they had more than moderate. Uh, so basically, they had more than 16% on PDFF. Uh, less than that, uh, they were not excluded. The data and literature, they're talking about 10%. So they used 10% uh, on PDFF as, as their, uh, I'm sorry, 10% on pathology based on their definition for, um, for osteotosis. At these two major papers that I saw, their definition was based on PATH, 10%. So technically, more than just uh, minimal and mild osteotosis. So those are the ones that they showed correlation with the outcome. Uh, uh, I'm not 100% sure that what is the exact cutoff that uh, we have, but my understanding is that it's very, very case-based. Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like at your institution, you report the proton density fat fraction, and then the surgeon integrates that information with a bunch of other information and makes his or her decision, but there's not a binary cutoff. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And also, uh, that's one of the reasons, I'm sorry for interrupting, that uh, we tend not to go with the uh, the size. So, you know, we just report that there is a larger um, sectoral vein measure at this, rather than just saying that, you know, we're not dictating what type of surgery to do or whether or whether to do it or not to do it. It's more of just be descriptive. And as I said, like, there are patients that they're, you know, they have, like, infiltrative HCC with numerous uh, lesions that they get a living donor transplant and they do okay uh, uh, within a couple of years. There are cases that they're just barely out of Milan and then they get that. So I think it's really, uh, they also put it into consideration that what's the likelihood of good prognosis for the recipient and that also dictates that how likely they are to, to you know, find a donor and do the surgery. Now, do you, um, do you actually have a standard templated uh, report that you use? Because I think in your slideshow, you showed uh, some um, general guidelines from Natalie Horvat. Right, right. We, we don't. Actually, uh, we, uh, Anya was also very interested in having a templated report, so we talked about it. And uh, that the thing that we sent for RSNA, the main focus will be for that. And then we thought about, uh, we thought about uh, getting input, having a you know, the survey and getting input from different institutions and also with different surgeons. Abby Humar, our surgeon, said that he will help us to make it more meaningful uh, template. Uh, we do not have a template. Uh, it, all of those uh, checkpoints, I think, sort of we have in our <laughs> mind. Right. Uh, yeah. But but we don't we don't have a template report uh, for surely. Um, now marching into the future, um, do you think that these reports? Um, should be purely um, verbal in the sense that you would just be describing things? Or do you think if marching into the future, if we had the technology, the report would actually show images, either either schematic drawings yeah. representing That's, what's happening yeah. or or ex like the, all the examples you showed where you were labeling the various vessels? That's, uh, that, I think that's a very, very, very good point because um, uh, I think uh, it's just not the report, but also give them some visual representation. So I think, uh, you know, we, we make sure that we are marking, given the image number. Obviously, some of these variants are very obvious, uh, but all, some of them are like subtle. So we make sure that, you know, we mark them, uh, give them image number. Uh, and also, like, you know, we talk to our surgeons, make sure what type of post processing they prefer to have. So, uh, and, and, and any time we see something weird, some venous uh, um, uh, aberrancy that is not well shown on our pre existing reformats, we always do it ourselves on Vitrio, do another MAPE or curved uh, reformat, just make sure that uh, they have a good look at it so that they are prepared for, for the surgery as the best possible. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Um, I do have one other question, which is a little bit off topic, uh, but I wanted to ask Khaled if I may ask another question or have other people submitted questions and we should turn it back over to the audience. Uh, Khaled, you're lucky that I'm in a good mood, so go ahead and give the question. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Khaled. As, as always, you are 
the most intelligent and kindest human being I know, uh, Amir, you're, you're, you're number two. So don't, don't be <laughs> feeling uh, out of um, two. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah you're, you're second out of two. Right. Um, uh, uh, Amir, not to put you on the spot, but you mentioned something that some people in the audience may potentially not have understood. Uh, you were talking about fat percentage as expressed as PDFF, but then you were also talking about fat percentage on histology. Just in case there's anyone in the audience who doesn't understand that difference, uh, would you mind explaining what the difference is between percentage on PDFF and percentage on histology? Oh, uh, well, obviously, I mean, you're the person to, <laughs> to explain it much better than us, but uh, obviously the person density fat fraction doesn't go above 50%. So for the lower color limit, I think uh, there's some concordance. So uh, on path, uh, more than 5% is considered um, uh, steatosis, uh, which on MRI, like, you know, based on the larger size uh, studies, is like closer to 6, uh, correct me if I'm, uh, I'm wrong about the numbers. But when you go up to different levels, then you start to see uh, discordance between these numbers because for PATH, less than 5 is normal, and then 5 to 33%, and then 33 to 60%, and above that, versus on MRI, the max cap is 50%, so our thresholds will be different. So more than 6% is mild, and then more than 16%, and then uh, more than, um, uh, help me with that threshold for the severe steatosis on MRI. Oh, uh, yeah, that's about 22%. But right, no, so thank you, Amir, yeah. Um, what I, um, that was kind of a read my mind kind of question. So what I, what I was, um, what I'd like the people in the audience to understand, and, and maybe most of them, maybe even all of them do understand this already, and if they do, then I apologize. But just all be aware that, you know, histologically, uh, fat uh, is graded based on the percentage of hepatocytes that contain fat droplets. So you can imagine a situation where if every single hepatocyte contains a small fat droplet, then you would say that histologically, that's 100% steatosis. Uh, PDFF is not looking at the percentage of hepatocytes that contain fat droplets. It's asking basically uh, what percentage of the uh, liver uh, weight is composed of, uh, of fat. And so uh, it turns out that human livers almost never get beyond about 50%. Uh, occasionally they go a little higher. So like Scott Reeder tells me that he sometimes sees livers with 55% fat but that would be very, very rare. In general, uh, uh, the proton density fat fraction goes from zero to 50%, but histologically it goes from zero to 100%. And Amir, you're 100% correct that in the, in the lower amounts of fat, uh, PDFF and histology actually agree quite closely. So about 5% fat on PDFF is about 5% fat histologically, but 50% fat on PDFF is about 100% fat on, uh, on, on histology. Uh, so fundamentally, it's just a different thing that's being measured. Absolutely. Um, anyway, Khaled, back to you. Oh, thank you very much, Claude. You always make uh, the, the session very interesting and useful. We have, if I know that I have this question before you start speaking, then I would for sure given her the opportunity to give the question before you because it's one of our favorite atten attendees from Palermo, Federica. Mm -hmm. Federica. Yeah, okay, thank you, Colette. So uh, I have a question. Hi, Amir. Hi. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, in your experience, does the use of a pathobiliary phase uh, significantly improves the evaluation of biliary anatomy as compared to MR angiography? So do you normally look more at MR angiography or do you think that hepatobiliary phase is It's a better? very good question. To be actually, I I, uh, um, I looked into it. I couldn't find uh, a good uh, um, paper on it to see like how many cases, and I'm talking about these populations that they are younger, healthier, with usually with normal biliary tree, maybe some aberrancy, but normal is nothing dilated. Uh, so how many of cases really that delayed phase is helping us? And I couldn't find anything. Uh, in uh, to be honest, in my um, experience, is most of the time is just increasing the confidence than changing. So it's like usually between your 2D and 3D uh, MRCs, you already have a good guess. Obviously, you know you can also use the uh, single shot 
so between them, you already have a good gas, and those uh, delayed phases um, usually just increases your confidence about the anatomy. Uh, I personally never had something that, well, I never saw it before, and now it just popped up. Uh, there are, like, in a couple of cases, I think one of them I showed that um, uh, the 3D MRC failed, even with three attempts, and then uh, the uh, Contrast enhanced MRC was fine, but also the 2D was fine too. So, but in those couple cases, I think we were lucky that 2D MRC, like it was like a non complicated biliary anatomy, that 2D MRC would have been sufficient anyway. Um, so, so, so I don't know. I don't know, like really, uh, how many percentage you have cases. And, and to be honest, like you know, uh, in many centers, they do IOC uh, regardless. Um, in uh, my center, they don't do IOC for the whole anatomy. They just do it like the one that I showed after ligation, mainly to mainly to uh, make sure there's no tiny leak. So it's not for delineation of the anatomy; it's mostly for that. So, so it's interesting to know that you know what each center do in terms of like routine IOC for all patients. Um, something I didn't mention, like uh, I don't think they do it anymore, but they used to do it. So they they, they used to do ERCP, ERC on these patients, which I think is you know, uh, a little bit invasive. Uh, but uh, I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I would, uh, I don't see any more questions and I would conclude. I think this was very uh, comprehensive and informative lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Barani. Um, My pleasure. Thanks for appreciate having me. that. And tomorrow we'll have a, a lecture that would complement today's lecture with Dr. Abhinav Humar, he is a world-renowned transplant surgeon. We all look forward to his lecture tomorrow. So thank you very much, Dr. Burhani, for this lecture again. Thanks for everyone for coming. And we'll continue till at least the end of this week. And uh, hopefully we'll have plans to have our uh, lectures continue on a different pace in the future. Thank you very much, everyone.